Welcome. This is Kenneth Daniel Willis with Preach the Truth Broadcast. This is going to be part four of our King James Version issue series. The King James Version versus the Corrupt Versions. This episode is really a standalone episode, which means you could watch this without watching the previous three or the future episode that's going to be done. Of course, I would strongly recommend you watch all of them. If you haven't yet, you'll you'll get a much better understanding and a much better um, context of what's going to be said. But again, it's not needed. It, if all you're going to do is look at this one episode, you would at least see how modern English translations change things, omit things, and even add things in some cases. Well, I've got my sweet tea. I'm ready. We've got about 57 slides, and we're just going to get right into it. This episode will be posted on preachthetruthkjv.wordpress.com along with this slideshow. Please feel free to replicate this, use it, share it. You don't need any permission to do any kind of replication of it. Just get it out, use it. And I hope it is a a tool that you know, with along with teaching and understanding, will help anyone who hears it to understand that there are, first of all, great differences between the King James version. And and again, we're not saying that it's so much the King James version; it's the text of the Greek text and the Hebrew text from which the King James is translated. It's the only English version that uses the Masoretic Hebrew text and the Textus, Receptive, uh, Textus Receptus exclusively. All other English Bibles use corrupted manuscripts from other Hebrew texts and corrupted manuscripts of the Greek text who were put together by apostate liberal heretics. And if you want to know all about those apostate liberal heretics, heretics, please see video number three. All right, for the rest of this time, I'm going to just try to just stick with this issue and not refer back to the other material already covered. If you want to know any of that, just go back, look at it, and then this will still make sense, but it will have much more context. All right, let's get into it. The liberal versions and their attack on Christ. If you were, well, obviously you don't remember if you haven't watched them yet, but the very first thing we stated in this series is that any attack on Scripture, any casting doubt on Scripture, any attack to all, any attempt to alter Scripture is ultimately and literally an attack on the Word of God, which is, remember, the spoken word the written word, and the living word, which is Jesus. So any attack on Scripture is a personal attack on Jesus Christ. Let's see some examples of modern versions versus the King James. There will also be some slides in this presentation that will show you certain words that have been omitted uh, and how frequently, usually the words that are the more serious words and more uh, frequent omissions. So just so you understand that, but most of this video is going to contain actual side-by-side -side comparisons of how the liberal modern versions change the Word of God. All right, we're going to start off with a couple verses to consider, and then we'll get right into it. Matthew 7, 16 through 20, Jesus said, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. The manuscripts, if you'll go back to uh, the second part of the series, there is a corrupt, shady, suspect line of manuscripts and there is a traditional handed down proven safe and handled by honorable means lineage of manuscripts the king james of course comes from 
the good line, all other English translations come from the corrupt line. Consider these words of Christ as we as we consider this. First Peter one twenty three says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Remember, a lot of these people who promote the modern translations and promote textual criticism, and by that they really mean German higher rational criticism, they believe that the Word of God was inspired in the original manuscripts and was preserved in the original manuscripts, meaning that all manuscript copies after that, they cannot say for sure that they're preserved, and a lot of them really don't believe they were inspired either. They just won't say it. But this verse tells us that the Word of God, the true Word of God, is incorruptible, and it liveth and abideth forever. Now, there are three kinds of corruption, and you will see all three in this episode. Firstly, there's changing of the reading. Secondly, there's partial omission, where you you say if the sentence is, I am hungry, you just say, I hungry, or I am. You leave out something. And then, of course, total omission, you just leave the whole sentence out, or whole word, or in some cases, verses, or even uh, part of a chapter, or even uh, some books. Revelation is left out of the revised version um, of, of the, the the Alexandrian Greek text leaves out the book of Revelation. I wonder why. Because it has a huge warning against omitting or adding to the word of God in that book. All right, Hosea 11.12. Let's look at this. First of all, we're going to... Actually, let, I already mentioned this in a previous episode, but if you'll go back and read Satan's conversation with Eve, you'll see all three kinds of corruption taking place. First of all, Satan changed what God says. He then omitted something that God says. And then he completely left out something else God said. So if you will go back and look at that, you'll see that. But moving on, Hosea 11.12, the King James Version says, and I won't read the whole verse, I'll just read what's in in bold here just for sake of time, but it says, Judah yet ruleth with God. And is faithful with the saints. So Judah yet ruleth with God. So Judah is still with God. And God is got his hand on Judah. Because out of Judah will come the Messiah. Which will redeem not only Israel, but the whole world. The NIV just says, and Judah is unruly against God. Wow, that completely... Changed the made it changed the reading there. It's incredible. Genesis twenty two one. This is where God is speaking to Abraham, and He tells him, He says, uh, "Get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering." Okay, He's going to offer him up for a burnt offering, and is it is during that burnt offering where He's offering up his son and he's about to kill him because he's offering him up the angel of the lord stops him the niv says take your son your only son whom you love and go to the region of moriah and sacrifice him there so it adds to it saying go ahead and kill him the king james says as does the hebrew that you are to offer him up to god as a sacrifice it doesn't say that you have to kill him yet Okay, it implies it implies that you're going to offer him up and proceed with this as if you're going to, but it doesn't tell him to slay him yet. Abraham's faith was that he was going to go ahead and slay his son because he was going to believe that God would raise him up from the dead. So the NIV is added to it. So according to the NIV, God changed his mind and the angel told Abraham to disobey God and not slay his son. Yeah. It's going to get a lot worse. Just brace yourself. If you don't, uh, if you need some Advil or some sweet tea, you might want to grab that now. Isaiah 7, 14. Now, this is kind of a big deal, right? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the great sign that is given to an Israelite king. It's a prophetic sign that will happen one day to show that 
the Messiah is actually the Messiah. It is, the, it is a unique sign that never again and never before had happened. And will never happen again. But the NIV changes it to, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. That's not a sign. That happens every day. Young women conceive and bear children all the time. Matter of fact, that's 90% of the time how it works. It's a young woman conceiving and bearing a son. That is not a miracle. That is not a sign at all. So what they're doing is, according, if you, if you remember back in our episode 3 about Westcott and Hort, they did not believe in the divinity of Christ. They called that into question, and others like them that worked with them did not believe, in many cases, in the virgin birth. Right here, they've taken the virgin birth, making Jesus just another man, not God, because they didn't believe he was God. They didn't believe he was equal with God. They believed he was a created being, and they believed that he had a beginning right here. And it wasn't divine at all. That right there should help you get rid of that Bible translation. If you have an NIV, you can just take it throw it in the trash can right now. Because it just told you that Jesus is just another person. He's not divine. Micah 5.2 Now this talks about, this is talking about Messiah. It's a prophecy. It's a very famous prophecy telling where he's going to be born. Herod actually has his people look this up in the uh, account of the wise men where they go to to ask permission to go worship the new king of the Jews. They leave and, um, you know, Herod wants to look this up because he wants to go wipe him out. But it says here in the end, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Everlasting means eternal. No beginning. There was no beginning point of Jesus. The NIV just says from ancient times. That just means a long time ago, but he did have a beginning. The ESV says from ancient days. So just, you know, way back, you know, near the beginning, but he had a beginning. Because you understand, these translations come from a manuscript that was handled, constructed, and translated by men who didn't believe that Jesus was divine. So that's, you know, I tried to explain this in that video, episode 3. If you will listen to episode 3 and listen to the words of these men and what they thought, believed, and taught, and wrote... You'll understand why these things are changed the way they are. It's not just an accident. It's not just a, a random word choice. It's very specific, very intentional. Matthew 18, 3. The King James says, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The NIV says, Unless you change. The ESV says, Unless you turn. So, Jesus is saying, Let, except you be converted. Well, who does the converting? Do you do the converting? I know we use that word, you convert, as though you change religions. But in biblical terms, to be converted means the Holy Spirit comes in and does that converting. It's a supernatural act of grace where God changes our dead, rotten heart and makes us alive and brings us into the family of God. You can't do the converting yourself. You can't change yourself. Yet the NIV places salvation on works of you, as does the ESV. You try to reform yourself. You try to change yourself to the point where you're saved. It will never happen. So right there, we're seeing the supernatural act of God being written out of the Bible. John 3.16, would they really try to change this verse? Oh, yes, they would. I can't believe it either because it's such a well-known verse that anybody should be able to spot this. But it says that he gave his only begotten son. The NIV and the ESV say the only son, the one and only son. Here's the problem. All through the scriptures, we can find phrases like the sons of God. Even in the New Testament, it says we, will be, we are made the sons of God gave us power to become the sons of God. So God has sons, plural, but he only has one B 
begotten son. He only has one son that is actually physically related to him. That is physically of him. All the other sons that he has, like the angels in heaven, they are created beings. All of the sons that he has in what we would consider the saved through the ages have been spiritually born into his family. They are adopted sons. So they are attacking the, doc the, the doctrine of Christ's uniqueness. It's subtle. And I know a lot of people would probably get red-faced and argue with me, oh, but, but it says what... It's subtle, but if your eyes are opened and, you're, and you will just think a little bit, you will see that they are actually trying to attack. And it's not accidental. You can believe that or not, but it's completely 100% intentional. They're attacking the uniqueness of Christ. Daniel 3.25. This is a great litmus test. If you want to find out if your Bible translation is worth the money you paid for it, go to Daniel 3.25 right now. Pause the video. Go there. And I'll guarantee you, if it's not a King James Version, it's going to say something. It's going to change the identity of Jesus in the fiery furnace. If you don't believe me, the King James says... Nebuchadnezzar, remember, he takes the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He throws them into the fiery furnace, and all of a sudden, the guards get killed from the heat, and he looks in and he says, didn't we just throw three people in there? And they say, yes. And he says, I see four, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That phrase, like the Son of God, is used two places in the Bible. One time here, and one time in the book of Hebrews, referring to Melchizedek, who was also an appearance of Christ. Christ appeared many times in the Old Testament physically. We call it a Christophany. One of those times, probably the most obvious time in the Old Testament, is right here. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Capital S, capital G. And yet, in every other translation, they will change it to what the ESV, the NASB, the NET... NET, they'll all, whatever one you want to pick, they'll change it to some variation of a son of the gods or a, a god or a son of a god, lowercase. They're doing that on purpose because they are attacking the identity of Jesus Christ. Now, I understand in Aramaic, uh, Habar Elohim means literally the son of the gods, but you have to understand Elohim, or Elohim in Hebrew, Elohim, that's with an M, Elohim in Aramaic with an I, with an N. Both those words it are being used as a title of God Almighty. So it's son of God. Elohim means the God of gods, the, the greatest deity of all supernatural deities that there are, even if, even, you know, we know there aren't actual other deities in the sense of God, there's demonic, um, angelic beings. But it is a very grave mistake. You can go find a Hebrew, a Jewish rabbi, or a Jewish scholar who studies the Old Testament and actually knows Hebrew, and they will tell you that these new versions make a grave error in mistranslating that word and making it plural and lowercase there. It's an intensive Hebrew noun. An intensive Aramaic noun. So don't fall for that when people will say that. They'll try to say, well, you got blah, blah, blah. they are either just completely ignorant of what's going on in, in the actual languages, or they're just covering for it. It's a cop out because it is the most gross, flagrant writing off of the appearance of Jesus Christ in the entire Old Testament. And if you go back to episode 3 and just listen to the words of those men, you'll understand all that. Alright. 2 Timothy 3.16. Here's what the NAV... They, most of these modern versions have had to correct this because they realize uh, how it sounds. You know, maybe they realize people are catching on to this. But the King James says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The NAV says every inspired scripture has its use. That's saying that not every scripture is inspired. And that's exactly what Westcott and Hort believe. 
and exactly what they wrote, that not every scripture was inspired. Yeah. 1 Timothy 3.16 The KJV says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the, in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ as God. The NIV and the ESV make no mention of who is being talked about. They just say he appeared in the flesh. He was manifest in the flesh. That could be anybody else. I know this is not the most blatant one, but it's huge because they are changing the identity of Christ. They're changing the characteristics of Christ. They're changing him from being man and God. They're attacking that, and they do right on that, and they, do, they did believe that. They did not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. They just believed that he was someone that God chose to try to lead men to God. They did not believe that Jesus was actually God. 2 Corinthians 2.17 Paul speaking, he says, We're not as many which corrupt the word of God. Okay, well, I wonder why the, the corrupt versions would try to change this verse. <laughs> you spot my sarcasm? Guess what they're going to say? They're going to use this phrase. The NIV, ESV, NKJV, the New King James, it's no better than any of the others because it still uses the corrupt manuscripts. It just pretends to be the, the King James with updated English. It's not. It's not the same thing. It's probably the most dangerous because it... it comes in a, in a KJV package, you know, but it's not, okay? But they all say this. Basically, we are not those who peddle the Word of God. We're not like many who peddle or peddlers or who are peddling. We're not selling the world Word of God for profit. Well, actually, yeah, you are. They all are. That's why there's all these different versions to make money off of it. The King James Version was made without a copyright so that nobody could make money off of it. That's a whole other sermon that they don't want to hear either. But I wonder why all these other versions take out that phrase, corrupt the Word of God. You know why? Because that's exactly what they are. They are corruptions of the Word of God. They are done by people who are intentionally corrupting the Word of God. I know I sound a little mad in this video, but to be honest, it is hard to go through all the things we have in this series and then to read these things and not get a little upset. So forgive me if I sound like I'm, I'm mad. I'm really not. I'm drinking sweet tea. I'm smiling right now. I'm having a good time, uh, you know, making this video and, and drinking sweet tea. But I am a little upset at people that have intentionally corrupted the Word of God for profit and deceive others. And then I'm, I'm a little upset at men who frankly should know better. That support these guys. It, it, it's it's very concerning. It is, and I'll admit that I'm I'm a little uh, floored over that. Mark ten twenty four, KJV. How hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So this whole phrase that it's hard to enter into the kingdom of God is is qualified by for them that trust in riches. The NIV and the ESV just say how hard it is to enter in the kingdom of God. How difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's not hard to enter God's kingdom. It's not difficult. It is one of the easiest things in the universe because you trust in the one who did it for you. You trust in Christ. But see, when someone trusts in riches, they have a hard time letting go of their riches. They have a hard time choosing to love Christ over all their possessions and what they have and the, and the, the riches of this world. That's what Jesus was preaching about. And yet these two perversions have said, you know, it's just hard for people to be saved. It's hard for people to enter the kingdom of God. Wow. Jesus actually preached very strongly against people who tried to teach that, um, you know, that it was difficult to get to God, that it had to be earned. So I would be very afraid if I was these people who uh, who altered that. And what they did is they, they committed a partial omission there. But it's still an omission. It's still corruption. If your Bible has any of these omissions 
or partial omissions or alternate readings, you don't have a Bible. You know, you have a book that contains parts of the Bible, but you don't have a Bible. You have a corruption of the Bible. You have a perversion of the Bible. And I'm not trying to offend anyone who's who likes their other translation. I'm just telling you the truth. Like it or not, you have a counterfeit, perverted uh, corruption. And you need to get rid of it and get a real Bible. And you need to get the only translation in the world in English that was translated entirely from the traditional, received, safe, and trusted texts of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Isaiah 14, 12. Now, this is, this is huge. I don't know how they even defend this. I, I mean, I, I've heard people try to defend it, and it's it would be funny, but it's such a serious thing that they're doing that, it, you know, I can't really laugh at it. But it would almost be funny listening to them try to defend it. Okay, the King James Version says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? All right, even the Church of Satan, founded by Anton Levain, they know exactly who Lucifer is. Witches, Satanists, occultists, uh, any any of these, you know, pagan, demonic people that, that participate in these things, they know exactly who Lucifer is. So I wonder why corrupted translations would want to hide the name of Lucifer. Maybe because he's the, the, the grand architect of them? Maybe because he is, in fact, the one who came up with the idea of alternate translations? He did it in the Garden of Eden? Okay. Satan, or Lucifer, is, that's, that was his, uh, you know, that was his angel name before the fall. He was the first textual critic. He was the first uh, person to question the Word of God. And boy, look where that went. Anyone who ever questions the Word of God or tries to give you an alternate reading or tries to put doubt on what it actually says, whether or not they mean to, they are an agent of Satan. There's just no way around it. That doesn't sound nice, but there's when you're doing the devil's work, you know, you can't tell me that you're not working. You can't tell me that you're not helping him. The ESV changes it to Old Daystar, Son of Dawn. Well, that's interesting because the Bible later will call Jesus Christ the Daystar. You catch what's going on? The ESV, which the, the seminary out there uh, over there in where I went to school, Bob Jones, they recommend the ESV to their seminary students. That's their preferred version. They, they don't announce that officially, but anyone who goes there can tell you that. And yet, that translation equates Jesus and Satan as being the day star. So which one is it? How do you know? You can't. If it says the day star is, is, is Satan in one spot, and then it says the day star is Jesus in the other spot, you have to say... Because here they take out Lucifer, so they're saying that Jesus is the one who's fallen from heaven. It's incredible. The NIV goes another route and says, Morning star, son of the dawn. Well, later in the Bible it says that Jesus is the bright and morning star. So again, they are saying that Jesus has fallen from heaven. Do you see how they're attacking Jesus Christ? If you can't see that, I don't, I don't even know how to begin with you. I don't. And I'm not being uh, smart or, or dramatic. I just, if you don't see the problem here, you need to fall on your knees and beg God to give you discernment and beg God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and guide you into truth. He's the one that's going to teach you the truth. All I can do is point you to it and present it to you, but he's the one that's going to have to, to do the work in your heart to show you that this is the truth. Deuteronomy 23.17. Now this is a huge thing, and it's it's a huge thing in, in modern churches today. And I'm talking about churches that claim to be orthodox and, and for all, you know, on paper may be orthodox, but yet have certain views and things that make them really not truly orthodox churches. 
The King James Version says there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. What is a sodomite? Everybody knows what a sodomite is. It is a homosexual. It is bringing it back to the story of Sodom. That is where we get the first uh, mention of that in the scriptures explicitly of men being with men, women being with women, a sodomite. Oh boy, that's an offensive word today because we don't like to call them sodomites. We like to call them gays. They're happy. You know, the rainbow flag. We're going to take the symbol that God used when he said he would never wipe out man again for his wickedness, put it on a flag, and be sodomites to it. Boy, that if you want to talk about rubbing salt in the, in the wound of, of God and just really rubbing it in the face of God, whew, that's not going to work out too well. Well, the NIV and the ESV change it because, you know, the word sodomite's offensive to a lot of progressive Christianity. And we want to change it to those who maybe are an alternate lifestyle. So they're going to just take out the whole phrase sodomite and just say a shrine prostitute. Okay, well, that's that sounds a lot less offensive, doesn't it? Or a cult prostitute. Well, the word is sodomite. And they have changed it. And you can go into various denominations that use other versions, and they allow sodomites in their churches to be members. They even marry sodomites. Hey, some of them even allow sodomites to be the pastors. Shouldn't be. Everyone knows what a sodomite is. God says he it's an abomination to him, and these versions have changed it. And many of the other versions change it as well. I'm just showing you. I'm just showing you this because the NIV is very popular and the ESV is very popular, and it's the one that has pretty much taken over the Bible University, rather the university rather that I attended, and it and it kills me to see that. So yes, I'm I'm not picking at Bob Jones, uh, but you know they have no shame in it whatsoever. So you know I can be. I don't see how I can get in trouble for for pointing out what they would they would be happy to recommend this version to you in their seminary. They take constant pot shots at the King James. They have a systematic system in the freshman year of brainwashing every student that comes through and turning them against the King James and the received text. So, you know, God knows my heart and he can judge me for it however he sees fit, but I think it's wrong for me to just sit back and stay silent, you know, on it. So, and I, and I hope that uh, explains it. If not, then you'll just have to forgive me for it because it's hard for me to see people that should know better just systematically doing it. It's not like it's accidental. It's systematic. And I know so much about that that I would love to say, but I'm just I'm not here to just get into a, a mud slinging contest but it is it's sad and heartbreaking but the ESV is going to be in a lot of these slides because it's very popular you know it's not just at Bob Jones all over the English speaking world the English standard version is is gained incredible popularity and it's a terrible translation as you have seen and will see first so Kings 14 24 again the word sodomites plural there were sodomites in the land they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Well, again, the NIV and the ESV change it to male shrine prostitutes or male cult prostitutes. And I know some will argue, well, that's, you know, if you go and study the, the deep meaning of what a male shrine prostitute, you could deduce in your research that that could be referring to a sodomite. Okay, the point is they've changed it to try to hide the meaning and try to, to change the meaning. Because a male cult prostitute could be heterosexual as well, okay? So they just don't argue around it and try to play word games with me when it very clearly removes the word sodomite, okay? Luke 1.15. This is an interesting one. The King James says... And this is for speaking of John the Baptist. He will be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. These translations that I'm showing here, the NCV and the NLV, they change it from, from, from the mother's womb, from even from birth. Okay, so this is a little trickier. But what they're doing is they're trying to say, 
And the, a lot of other versions had to go back and revise this because they real. I guess they got busted, and people were. I don't know. Enough people made enough noise about it, but they're advocating abortion. Is what's is what that that's the motivation behind the way they translated it. I know you probably you may not be able to see that right off, but you can take my word for that, or you can go look it up. I prefer you go look it up, but the Bible here is saying that. He was a lie. As it says, even in, in Psalms, uh, David says that, you know, in my mother's womb, the Lord knew me. Before I was even, you know, still a cell, uh, you know, an, an egg in the in the uh, the uterus, the womb, I'm the Lord already knew me. So according to the abortionists and, and the progressive Christianity, which I, I don't even think those two words should go together, they will teach, well... Life starts at birth. And so if you want to have an abortion, you're not murdering a baby because it's not alive yet. It's not a soul yet. Uh, because it's, you know, it's just a fetus. It's just a bunch of cells. So, but these two versions are teaching that, yeah, you know, he wasn't, it, it, there was nothing special going on about him until he's born. Then he becomes alive. That's utterly insane. You know, we could go off on the abortion argument but uh if you you know w when animals are pregnant that unborn animal is given more rights and protection than a human that's unborn it's incredible you know but we understand why satan's the author of all of this it's it's all part of his regime and unfortunately a lot of so-called christians just buy into it lock stock and barrel all right Matthew 1 25 the King James is talking about this is talking about Joseph did not have intercourse with Mary until she had brought forth her firstborn son well who's her firstborn son her firstborn son is Jesus okay the NIV and the ESV attack the doctrine that he was virgin born and they say just a son brought forth her or brought forth a son. So it, it leaves ambiguity there that, and I know people are going to get up in arms and say, well, I'm sorry, but you don't understand the motivation behind the men who came up with this alternate reading. They did not believe Jesus was divine. They did not believe there was anything divine about his birth. They just believed he was another, another man. And so if you read the NIV or the ESV, you don't get that explicit statement here that Joseph was not the one who helped Mary conceive Jesus. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, not by Joseph. And he was the firstborn son of Mary. She had several other children, actually, you know, at least I think three or four other children after Jesus by Joseph. But Jesus his birth was unique. It was the most unique birth in all of history. And yet, the same guys who, who changed the words to a son here took out the word virgin. So, just understand, it's all intentional. It's all connected. Luke 2.33. Now, again, they're going to try to imply that Joseph fathered Jesus. Because the Bible says, and Joseph and his mother, speaking of Jesus, so Joseph and Jesus' mother. Why didn't it say father and mother? Because Joseph is not Jesus' father. He's his stepfather. You know, he's he's his earthly father that he lived with, but he did he was not biologically or genetically related to Joseph at all. Joseph had nothing to do with Jesus' birth. So it is correct that the Bible would say Joseph and Jesus' mother. But the ESV and NIV say father. Why? Because they believed that's who was the father of Jesus, not God. Is it is it making sense yet? If you have already watched the other parts of this, you're way ahead of somebody who hasn't because you understand why. You know, you can read all this stuff and see that there's a problem. Anybody can see there's a problem. But if you will look at the words of Westcott and Hort, you'll understand why everything they did, you'll understand why they did it and why they changed it. 
Luke 6, 48 says, and Jesus is, of course, giving a parable in which he is the, the gist of the parable. He is the rock. Well, of course, you know, the ESV, I'll just give you the ESV here, says they could not shake it because it had been well built. And there's a footnote there that says some older manuscripts do not use the word rock. Well, yeah, the older manuscripts they're referring to are the corrupt ones. And they're probably not even older, but that's another sermon. And you can go look that up with um, David Sorensen's book, Neither Older, Neither Oldest Nor Best. You can see that they're actually not even older, probably. So, yeah. And even if they are older, that, even, that proves even more that they're inferior. But, again, go back and look at the other videos for that. So, yeah, we're going to take out the gist of that because it, the gist of that parable is talking about building your life on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. And they just took it out of there. It's subtle, but they did it. Ephesians 3, 9. It says, Hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. In other words, God created and Jesus Christ created. Jesus and Colossians tells us that there's nothing made that was there's nothing that was made that wasn't made by Jesus Christ. He made everything. He is the creator. He's one with God. He is equal with God. Well, of course, these guys who wrote the other translations and who translated that text did not believe that Jesus was equal with God and believed that he was created. And so they say, hidden for ages in God, who created all things. Now, if you're a little sleepy, you may not get this. So wake up, take some caffeine, but do you see the difference? Who created all things by Christ or who created all things? That means Jesus Christ is included in that all things. And that's exactly what they believe. They wrote on that. Again, go back to, to video three. That, that's, that's heresy. <laughs> it's uh, denying the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's all throughout these examples. But I'm just trying to show you over and over. And hopefully... You will take these and use these. John 4, 42, the King James says, We and know that this is indeed the Christ, or the Christos in Greek, which is the Greek way of saying the Hebrew word Mashiach, the anointed Messiah. So we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. ESV just says, we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So they're eliminating Jesus' identity as the Messiah there, as the anointed one, as the Christ. Yeah. Remember, every attack on the Word of God is, is, is always going to end up being a literal attack on who? Ta-da! Jesus Christ, the Word they took out there. John 6, 69, Thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. The ESV just says, you're the Holy One of God. That could mean an angel. That could mean, you know, some special person in God's kingdom. It doesn't, it, again, it, it, it attacks the identity of Christ being, well, first of all, the word Christ is gone, but the Messiah. So it just completely eliminates that. I wonder who would do something like Who in all the universe would try to attack the identity? Oh, yeah, the devil. Guys, this is really not complicated. You don't you don't need a college degree to figure this out. You don't need uh, a high school diploma to figure this out. Philippians 2.6. Now again, this is echoing the theology of Westcott and Hort. It says, Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ did nothing wrong by claiming and being equal with God. But the ESV says, Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is very subtle. It's very clever. But they're saying that Jesus is not equal with God. He may have appeared like God, but he was not equal with God. And he didn't try to be equal with God. Heresy, spirit of Antichrist, denying Christ, all of it. Right here in the good old ESV. Yeah. First Peter 1.19. This is what I was talking about earlier with the Lucifer verse in Isaiah. 
Uh, KJV says, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. The ESV says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The NIV says, in the morning star. Both of them. They're both saying, until Lucifer rises in your hearts. Or till the devil rises. The fallen one from heaven. Because that's who they're equating it with in, the, in uh, Isaiah. So either they made a galactic translating error, or they are equating Jesus with Satan himself. Take your pick. Either one means you got to throw those Bibles out. You throw those translations out. They're useless, worthless, unreliable, flawed, corrupt, perverted. Take your pick. Luke 23, 42. He said unto Jesus, this is the thief of the... I need some more sweet tea. The thief on the cross speaking to Jesus. Excuse me. And he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Well, the ESV just says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because remember, you're not God. In, in, the, in Westcott and Hort's mind, Jesus is not God, so there's no reason for that man to address him as Lord. It could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. I don't think you do either. I think you're smarter than that. Luke 22, 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. The whole point of this passage is Jesus is attesting to his divinity, and he's saying, I know something that no one else could know. No one else in the world could know that Satan has actually requested of God to have you. The same way he did with Job, you know, he said, "Let me, let me have Job, and I, let me, let me mess with Job, and and I'll get him to curse you." And God says, "Okay, you can do what you want to Job, but don't kill him, because I know he's gonna, you know, he's gonna remain faithful." But that was something only God could know, okay? And if it hadn't been written down by inspiration, no one in the history of the world would ever know that happened with Job, okay? The same kind of thing is going on with Satan. Satan demands to have him. He he asks God, "I want him." And Jesus is revealing to Simon and the other disciples, look, I am God, I'm divine, because I know a personal request Satan made to the Almighty God. And only I could know that if I am God. And the ESV, of course, because the ESV is a version that attacks the identity as Jesus being divine, it omits that whole phrase, and the Lord said, which is the whole point of this verse. And it just says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Okay. Um, well, how would how would somebody know that unless they were the Lord God? They wouldn't. Anybody could say that, but Jesus is using his identity as the Lord, and he's referring to himself as the Lord under inspiration, and they've taken that out. Nice. Revelation one eleven. Boy, this is pretty. Uh, this is pretty hard. I, I would be pretty embarrassed. On this one, it says in Revelation 1:11, this is Jesus speaking to John in the vision. He says, "Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book." Well, guess what they omit? They omit that whole phrase, "I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last." Now, why would somebody want to omit a powerful, exalted name of Christ. Oh, wait a minute, because it's Christ, and they don't like that. So they leave it out, and just says, write what you see in a book. They take out the author of the book of Revelation. Remember, the book of Revelation, John didn't write the book of Revelation, the content. He wrote it down, but all that content was given to him by Jesus, who revealed it to him. And Jesus is identifying himself here as, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Eternal One who has no beginning or end. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And they omitted the whole thing. It's going to get a lot worse. Luke 4.4 4. Jesus is answering the devil when he's tempted. He says, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. These people that promote these other translations and this liberal philosophy that God hasn't preserved his words except for the originals. Okay, well that means that nobody has the actual preserved word of God today. 
that's what they mean. And I'm going to do the fifth video on why that is such a hellacious teaching. Well, Jesus here says that every word, not just the thought, not just the sentence, not just the concept, but every word. He also says in another place, the jot and the tittle shall not pass. The smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the smallest marking does not pass. Well, of course, the ESV and the NIV aren't going to like that little phrase, so they leave it out. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by bread alone. So the, the whole powerful part of that statement is but by every word of God, and they leave it out. They, they completely rendered that verse useless and powerless because they took out the meat of it. Why would they do that, I wonder? Well, if you watched video number three, you know exactly why, don't you? Luke 4, 8. Jesus, again, is talking to Satan, and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. Well, the SV and NIV just omit the name Satan. And they omit the uh, rebuke to Satan. They work for Satan, so why would they uh, why would they put that in there? You know, that sounds hard, but these guys literally did Satan's work in the critical text. And the translations taken from the critical text are doing the same work. So we got to get rid of our... Uh, we don't want the name of our employer in there, do we? They take it out. So, I mean, who is Jesus talking to when he says that there? You could read that and come up with a lot of possibilities. They take Satan's name out and the rebuke. John 6, 47, the King James Version says, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. What's the point of this verse? You have to believe. You can't believe in religion. You can't believe in baptism. You can't believe in your good works. You can't believe in a church, a pastor. You have to believe on Jesus Christ. Well, the ESV takes that out. Just believe. Well, what do we believe? Good question. The NIV says the one who believes. Uh, well, again, what are you believing? It's, it's ambiguous, isn't it? And that's part of the teaching of Westcott and Hort of universal salvation. Universalism. That everyone will get saved. Because it's just a matter, as long as, whatever you believe, as long as you believe it and you're sincere, God's going to honor that and, and, and you're going to be saved. Even if you go to hell or go to purgatory, as they taught, eventually, because you believe, you will have everlasting life. Well, here they say eternal. Because, I mean, I know I'm getting a little upset here because even their, their word eternal just means you're going to have this mystical, spiritual... Um, feeling of just this this state of of like consciousness. You're not. It's not literal. It's not physical. But it's just like a a mystical consciousness of of happiness and peace out somewhere floating around in space. Whatever. They just completely shred the word of God. And so yes, I think we're right to be a little upset. Okay. They're just shredding the word of God. And people stand up in seminaries and pass this on to preacher boys. And it infuriates me. And it ought to infuriate me. Incredible. I mean, it just, every time I read it, it just kind of hits me over afresh. I just don't, I don't understand how you can claim the name of Christ and claim to know what you know and really believe the Word of God and get up and. Um, not only translate like that and, and write things like that that they did, but then men today who get up in seminaries and, and hold them up like they're great men and they're, like they're sound doctrinally. They're everything but sound doctrinally. They're heretics, apostates, and they, sh they are sh corrupting and shredding the Word of God, trampling the name and deity and person of Christ, and as a person who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, that deeply offends me. You know, so be it. For, uh, 1 John 4, 3, the King James Version says, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. So 
Yes, we've already talked about this, but Les Scott and Hort had the spirit of Antichrist because they didn't believe that God had actually come in the flesh. They just believed that he was just a man. Okay? Well, the NIV is going to echo that sentiment and say, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus, and then they omit the part about coming in the flesh. Did you know the demons acknowledge Jesus? Several times when Jesus cast out demons, they said, Hey, you are the Son of God. We know you, the Holy One of God. It says that the, the uh, let's see here, it says, You believe in God? You do well, for even the demons fear and tremble. The demons acknowledge the existence of Christ, but they don't believe on Him. They don't confess Him as their Savior. Well, the NIV and the ESV, that's pretty bad. Now, of course, the ESV does say, confess Jesus. They got that part right, but they left out his come in the flesh. The NIV is probably the worst translation in English ever. That's not even really a, a big debate. Even people that like modern versions will admit that the NIV is a terrible translation. But the ESV is not much better at all, and yet they act like it's great. I'll never forget sitting in chapel in the university and hearing probably the greatest counselor, whatever, their opinion, that they have out there who's a doctor and he's always so famous. You would know exactly who it is. And he got up and said, you know what, we got a huge shipment of ESV study Bibles coming in in three or four days to the bookstore. Everybody go over there, sign up and get you one and study the Word of God like never before. They should have fired him on the spot, but they, they believe like him. So all along, we haven't had the good Bible. We've had the King James, and all of a sudden, this corrupt ESV is coming out, and we need to go get it and run to it and just study the Word of God like never before. It's not even the Word of God. It's, it's a perversion of it. Oh, it just, I don't, I don't, oh, I don't even know how to, uh, I don't even know how to, to rectify that in my mind, how you can be that way. I don't even, I don't even know. Matthew 17, 21, uh, in reference to, to demons, the disciples couldn't cast out some demons. They come back and say, why couldn't we cast out these demons? And Jesus said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. The NIV and the ESV, they completely omit this entire sentence. Why, I wonder. Could it be, and this is just my humble opinion, and I don't think I'm going out on a limb here, could it be that the author of perverted Bibles didn't want people to know how to hinder his minions? Just a thought. Mark 9, 29, And he said unto them, This kind came forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Again, both admit, uh, omit it completely. They just say, uh, this, come, th this kind cometh not out by prayer, but by prayer. They leave out fasting. Everybody prays when they try to cast out a demon, but not everybody fasts. And they leave it out. The power to stand against Satan's armies and against his workers is something Satan doesn't want us to know about. And that is why it is not here in these versions. You believe what you want. Matthew 18, 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Both versions there leave it out completely. I guess Satan wouldn't want people to know that the Son of Man has come into the world to save that which is lost. I mean, if I was Satan, I wouldn't want people to know that. And if you read the NIV and ESV, and that's all you ever read and didn't know any other version, you would never know that verse. But praise God, it is in the King James Version because it is in the originals. In the trusted, traditional, handed down, received, proven text of the scriptures. Not one word has been lost. Hallelujah. Matthew twenty three fourteen. the King James says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. That's completely omitted from the NIV and the ESV. You starting to get the picture, folks? I mean, 
You see these? You see why these things wouldn't be in other versions? I sound like a broken record, but you know, each one just—it's just like you just can't believe it. No matter how many times you read it, you just can't believe they did it. Mark eleven twenty six. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Kind of a big deal, right? Well, it's not in the NIV or the ESV, and other versions as well. Uh, or again, I'm just giving you the two most popular modern translations. Oh, this is a long section, but this whole thing you see on the screen is left out of the NIV and the ESV. Let's just look at a few key points that the ESV and the NIV chose to leave out. And I wonder why they might do that. Because first one is Jesus was risen early the first day of the week. Yeah, Satan might want to leave that out of the Bible, you think? He appeared first to Mary. He actually appeared after he raised from the dead to somebody. Yeah, let's leave that out. Satan would definitely want to leave that out. Uh, after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. So another another evidence of his resurrection, well, Satan left it out. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. Left it out again. Uh, Jesus gives the great commission. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. The Great Commission. Go into the kingdom, go into all the world and, and turn people from Satan's kingdom. Yeah, Satan's going to want to leave that out, and he did. The signs shall follow. All these signs that you know the, the apostles did. Paul took up a serpent. These kinds of things. They laid hands on the sick. All these signs. In some form, the apostles did all these signs. And yet, uh, you know, we're going to leave that out of the Bible. I think you all know at this point why that was left out of the Bible. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Jesus was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And these things were confirmed by more signs. Yeah, let's leave out the fact that Jesus raised from the dead, appeared to people, gave the Great Commission, and was received up into heaven. Let's leave that out. And I know, I can hear them now, some of these people screaming, well, the other Gospels mention that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is pretty explicit stuff, and, and they leave this. They leave 9 through 20 out completely. If you leave one word out of the Bible according to God, you have perverted the Word of God, and you are guilty of that. These people are leaving the whole second half of a chapter out. Wow, I wonder why they did it. Oh, we know better, don't we? Acts eight thirty seven. Boy, this is this is incredible. I actually have before told people in these when I've done um, series on this and done presentations on this. If anybody in here have an ESV, you know, or NIV, my raising hand, whatever. All right, I will give you a hundred dollars if you will read to me Acts eight thirty seven out of that version. And they'll scramble through their Bible, you know, and then they'll just they'll look at their Bible like they're seeing things, they'll hold it up, look at it, and go, it's not in there. And it won't be. Why? Well, it says, uh, you know, the, the eunuch says, what must I do to be saved? Well, that might be something Satan might want to omit from the Bible. How to be saved, how to be free from the devil. Jesus said, uh, if you believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How much more explicit can you get? And the NIV and the ESV, these great translations that our seminary students should have, leaves it out. If you're in a seminary that teaches that, you're not in a seminary, friend. You're in a cemetery. You need to get out of there. You are in a whitened sepulcher full of dead men's bones. Get out of there and put your money to better use doing anything but that. 1 John 5, 7 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The greatest explicit proof of the Trinity in all Scripture. And guess what? You know the rest, don't you? Omitted. Why would Satan want to leave the Trinity out of the Bible? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's look at the word hell and 
the King James Version uses the word hell 54 times. The NIV omits that word 41 times. So is it all but 13 times? The NIV leaves that word out. Oh, they replace it now. Uh, 41 times they will replace the word hell with grave, Hades, or realm of the dead. ESV, same thing. New KJV, not as bad, but still pretty bad. Why would these modern versions use replacement words such as grave, Hades, realm of the dead, Sheol? Well, if you watched video number three, you know why, don't you? Because they did not believe in a literal place called hell that was a literal place of torment. They just believed that hell is where all dead people, dead spirits go, and there's no, there's no actual punishment for sins. And as a matter of fact, people physically go to purgatory. And they can get out of purgatory and go to heaven. So yeah, that would explain that one. But just for those who didn't know, that's why they do that. Does it make sense now? The word Jehovah. This is this one even surprises me. Uh, and, and when I first heard this long ago, I couldn't believe it either. I thought surely they wouldn't be stupid enough to leave the word Jehovah out. But they will. How many times do they do it? Well, it's only mentioned in the Bible seven times. And all seven times they omit it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder why they would do that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we know why they do that. All right. We've talked about the two streams of texts. Let's talk about the two vines of text, the two vines of manuscripts. The Bible actually addressed, you know, God knew this was going to happen. God knew that this issue was going to come up in history. He knew that people would try to corrupt the scriptures and take the one language in the world that is the, pretty much the universal world language, the predominant language in the world, English, and they would try to push off a corrupt set of manuscripts and make all English translations come from a corrupt manuscript. God knew that. God knows everything. He knows the future like it's history. God thought of this. And watch what he says. Deuteronomy 32, 32 and 33 says, For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. That is describing this line of critical Alexandrian liberal texts. Where did it come from? It comes from people who rebel against God. It's the poison of the dragon. It is the venom of a serpent. Wow. Well, what vine should we go for? Well, John 15, Jesus told us, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. There's two choices out here. You can go with... Satan's vine or you can go with the true vine it's amazing that God had that all worked out he's teaching us here in a picture and I think he was actually looking ahead to this issue because if you you've seen this slide before if you've watched the other videos the liberal Alexandrian texts disagree with themselves 3036 times just in the four gospels we're not even talking about the other books if you got two witnesses up against me in court and they had 3,036 discrepancies in their testimony, it doesn't matter what I did, I'm getting off scot-free because there ain't a judge, jury, or court in the world that would allow that kind of testimony to go against me. They would laugh them people out of there. They would make national news. And yet, we're going to take that kind of testimony and say that it's the word of God? And we're going to base everything we believe on that? You see how ridiculous that is? And by the way, 
the uh, the text, the Alexandrian Greek text. It's in its 28th revision. It may be more by now. I don't know. It's kind of like the French Constitution. They've got a bunch of them up in the uh, double digits. I believe they got like 26 of those. But that's, that's kind of a history joke. But uh, this ain't the Constitution of a country. This is supposed to be the Word of God. And you have to fig you have to go back and revise it 28 times. And I'm not talking about spelling revisions and grammar. I'm talking about content revision. They don't know what it is. If you look over at Sinaiticus, uh, you can go all through that thing and see with the naked eye where scribes have penciled in other words over top of the word. They, I mean, it was like they were having a debate as they were translating it. As they were copying, the scribes were like fighting back and forth because one said, well, this word should be this and that. and blah. You know, that's why they found it in a trash can. It wasn't nothing but trash. And all of a sudden... These liberals pull it out and say, hey, this is really the Word of God. We got it wrong all these years and centuries, and now we have the Word of God. Yeah. Give me a break, man. If any other field or any other uh, legal team ever tried to present this case, they would, they would be disbarred from the legal profession. And yet these men try to push this off as the Word of God. It's, it's, it is mind-blowing. Here's what David C. Parker said, the United Bible Society. He said, the text is changing. Every time that I make an edition of the Greek New Testament, or anybody does, we change the wording. We are maybe trying to get back to the oldest possible form, but paradoxically, we are creating a new one. Every translation is different, every reading is different, and although there's been a tradition in parts of Protestant Christianity to say there is a definitive single form of the text, the fact is you can never find it. There is never, ever a final form of the text. That is so anti-Bible. That is so anti-truth. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. It is a testimony founded forever. Wow. Not one jot nor tittle shall pass from the law, and yet this guy says, well, you, you, just, you just can never find it because it's constantly changing. Uh, no, the Bible never changes. Perversions constantly change because men try to just keep changing it. And only Satan is the one who does change the scriptures. Satan's the only one who... He's the father of that. This slide's just going to show you some things, and we used this in, I believe, the last video as well. So you can go back and look at that, but this is just some quick facts about it. The King James Version, it's not that I'm King James only. I am... The correct text only. You know, I only want the the authentic Hebrew and Greek text. I don't I don't care about what translation it is as long as it's taken from those texts. And the King James Version is the only translation in English on the planet in history that has been completely taken from those texts. All translations prior to the King James, such as the Geneva Bible. You know, you have the Tyndale Bible, the Wycliffe Bible. They were working up to it, but they were not done with the completion and the academic excellence and just the safety that the King James was done with. Because they, at the time, in all honesty, those men many times were risking their lives doing the translation work. The King James was a legalized translation. King James, all he did, the only thing King James had to do with it is that he made it legal for those men to assemble. And he made it possible for them to take the time and be careful and cross-check it against one another, cross-check it against committees of themselves, and then individually cross-check everything against everybody else individually. And so it is the most excellent translation ever. But it's because of the texts from which it was translated. Okay? If I translate Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, if I translate it perfectly, it doesn't matter that I translated it perfectly. It's still garbage, okay? It's the source that determines the validity of it. And when you have these other corrupt manuscripts, it doesn't matter how accurately you translate them because you're translating a corrupt source. I wish people would understand that. And sadly, that what I just told you is not communicated in 
say, the freshman Bible program over at Bob Jones. That whole side of the argument, this whole side of it, this whole side of it, they leave that out and they just say, well, the King James mistranslates from the Greek. Well, which Greek text? Okay. When they say that, just ask them, well, which Greek text did it translate from? They probably won't know, or if they do, they'll be in shock that you knew that. So it's just, it's deceptive. I, I, just, I, I find it very deceptive and very dishonest and very immoral that they do that. But they're not the only ones that do it. I'm just, I, that, that's my experience because that's where I went and I witnessed it. But it's happening all over the world, okay, but especially in the United States and Britain. That is the end of our slideshow, ladies and gentlemen. I will produce a fifth part that will deal with the truth and the proof that God not only inspired his word in the originals and not only preserved them in the originals, but he has preserved them today 100% accurately with not one mistake in it. You either believe that or you don't. You either believe that God can preserve his word or you believe that man has to scientifically reconstruct it. Starting in the 1850s, these German higher critics who were apostates, God had to wait 1850 years for these men to come out and somehow reconstruct through scientific liberal methods the scriptures. So all that time we didn't really have the right Bible. And now we have theirs. And they say that we, we never really know what the actual text is because it's constantly changing. Give me a break. All right. Well, if you hung in here, congratulations to you. You should go get you a glass of sweet tea and reward yourself well. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Stay in the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. That's what he is. He's our teacher, and he will lead us into all truth if we will listen to him. Because every man that wants to say all this stuff about this and try to make up all this stuff, let God be true. Every man will be found a liar and God will be found true. This is Kenneth Daniel Willis for Preach the Truth Broadcast.